Uh, good morning, church. It's good to see everyone here today. <clears throat> it's, uh, it's a joy to hear that uh, you have a, a new a good prospective candidate. So we'll be praying uh, that uh, the Lord gives you the right man to, to pastor this flock. And uh, that's exciting to hear. So we're, we're praying along with you. And I'm sure the Lord will, will answer prayer. Please turn with me this morning to Job chapter 26. The book of Job chapter 26. And just follow along as I read, beginning in verse 6. Hell is naked before him, and destruction hath no covering. He stretcheth out the north over the empty place, and hangeth the earth upon nothing. He bindeth up the waters in his thick clouds, and the cloud is not rent under them. He holdeth back the face of his throne, and spreadeth his clouds upon it. He hath compassed the waters with bounds until the day and night come to an end. The pillars of heaven tremble and are astonished at his reproof. He divided the sea with his power, and by his understanding he smiteth through the proud. By his spirit he hath garnished the heavens, his hand hath formed the crooked serpent. Lo, these are the parts of his ways, but how little a portion is heard of him. But the thunder of his power, who can understand? Let's uh, bow together in prayer. Our Father, we do thank you for who you are. We thank you, Lord, for your power, for your omnipotence. You have the power to keep your promises. You have the power to save to the uttermost. And Lord, as we consider these things this morning, we are in awe of our God. And I just pray, Lord, that you would... Uh, speak to hearts. Use this preacher to uh, preach in the power of your spirit. Lord, we would see Jesus and not this preacher. And Lord, just, just bless your word. Meet our needs. Feed us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, Job tells us basically, to sum up what he's saying here, he's basically saying that God is incomprehensible. And in other words, we see some of God... You see little glimpses of God, but we can't see all of Him. And specifically, Job's talking about God's power. You know, in a small measure, we can see God's power, but we don't know the full extent of His power. We may think we do. We think of the universe, and we think of, of uh, some pretty amazing things. But we can't really grasp the, the fullness of His power. His power is infinitely more than we could even imagine. In Habakkuk chapter 3, we're not going to turn there, and uh, there's a lot in that, that prayer of Habakkuk that gives a great depiction of the power of God. And uh, at the end of verse 4 in Habakkuk 3, you read, you know, there was the hiding of his power, there was a veiling of his power. You know, where was this veiling? What, what's it talking about, veiling of his power? And in this description of uh, Habakkuk, it, it describes, you know, the power of God walking through the land and destroying his enemies and riding upon the waves as he thunders from the heavens with a great voice. And what Habakkuk is saying is this is the veiling of his power. All these great displays of God's power that we see around us is but a veil over his infinite, almighty power. And uh, his... Uh, his might is hidden behind these meager feats. And when you consider that, just think, wow, what, a, what an amazing, powerful, wonderful God that we have. That, what's he going to be like when he finally reveals you know, more of his power to us? Will we be dumbfounded and, and just awestruck by how great our God really is? And we think about God as an awesome God and how great our God is, but do we really understand just how great he is? We think of this universe and how immense it is. Uh, and uh, we, we think of time and how, you know, <laughs> you know this, this, right now, from the beginning of time and, and, until, you know, all eternity. Just understand God is greater than all of this, and we can't possibly even comprehend these things. 
In Genesis chapter 17 and verse 1, it says, The Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. I am the Almighty God. That's the Hebrew word which many of us know as El Shaddai. El Shaddai it means it's, it's a word where we get the, the English word omnipotent. And, and it's actually a direct transliteration of the, the Latin word. Almighty in Latin uh, it would be omnipotent. And uh, omni means potent, and that means power. And uh, God is all powerful. Omni means, no, omni means, yeah, potent means power. Omni means all, so it's all powerful. You know, 56 times in our English Bible, well, it depends on what version you have, at least in the King James. Uh, anyway, the, the English Bible, we see the phrase almighty. And every, 56 times, in every one of those times, it refers to God. And uh, God alone is mighty. God being almighty means that he has something that no one else possesses or can possess. There can only be one who is almighty. No one else. You know, he exudes and, uh, and w with an inconceivable plenitude of power. And that means he's above every other single power there is within and beyond the universe. To our minds, it's just incomprehensible that, that he is all-powerful. But I would say it's equally incomprehensible that he's not all-powerful. Is that me? <laughs> uh, that he's not all-powerful. You know, how could you have a God that is not all-powerful? Imagine God willing to do something, but not having the power to carry it out. That's not God. You know, that, that's a creation of man's mind. That's a superhero, but that's not our God. Thomas Watson, the great Puritan, wrote, Take away a king's power, and we unking him. Take away God's power, and we ungod him. You know, power and authority are often confused, and they do overlap from time to time, but they're not one and the same thing. You see, you can have authority but men can resist, resist authority. They can try to usurp it. They can stage a coup d'etat. Uh, they can try to overthrow the throne and the government. Uh, they can defy authority. But power is different because to bring power and authority together means that God himself has the power to enforce his authority. The arch of God's power spans over all of his attributes. You know, and think about it. You know, what would be the point of God having a great plan with all wisdom and great love toward us and being ever faithful if he was impotent to carry it out? If he hasn't the power to be what he says he is, then he's not God. He's a fraud. You know, without power, his mercy would be pity. Without power, his precious promises were ju or just wishful thinking. They'd be nothing. As Stephen Charnock says, his threatenings would be a mere scarecrow. But God's power is like himself. It's infinite, eternal, incomprehensible. It can neither be checked, restrained, or frustrated by the creature. Psalm 89 verse 6 says, For who in the heavens can be compared unto the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty can be likened unto the Lord? And Daniel in, in uh, chapter 4 and verse 35 says, All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of earth, and none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? What a mighty God that we have. As children of God, does, not, does that not thrill our hearts to know that our God is so powerful? You know, that's the God that we come here today to worship. We come to meet with Him. We come to uh, worship Him. We come to praise Him. We come to fellowship with Him. You know, a, a God who is almighty, who is omnipotent, who has all power. Now, what are some of the significant veiled glimpses that we have of God? And uh, that's what I want to look at, first of all. I want to look at some of these, these glimpses of God's power that we see. You know, in seeing the power of God, it crushes and buries the pride of man. 
I have to chuckle at people who think that they're going to stand before God and shake their fist and say, you know, and stand, bef- and stand up to God and, and give Him a piece of their mind. That, that's such foolishness. It's nonsense. Every one of us, if we stand before God, we can do nothing but fall on our faces when we see His majesty and His magnitude and, and His, His power. Imagine what Job heard when God told him, Where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if you have understanding. To where can we see the power of God? First of all, you see it all around us in creation. You know, our world today sees laws of nature rather than the power of God. You know, the world's not willing to give any glory to God. And we look about and we see this beautiful world that we live in that was created with us in mind, you know, and, and we enjoy the, uh, the benefits of this world even though it's, it's fallen like the rest of us, but, but yet there's so much beauty there that God has put in place. You know, when great and mighty things happen all around the world, good or bad, the world always attributes it to the laws of nature or Mother Nature or, or the hand of man. You know, it's global warming. We caused it all. We did all this bad stuff. Now, but God's power is pretty much ignored. In Job chapter 9, verse 8, we read, He treads upon the waves of the sea. You know, that's a, you know, that's a, a powerful sea, basically what he's saying there. A powerful sea is under the feet of God. It's under the feet of God. In other words, God's, God's, uh, this God's uncontrollable power. Uh, he, he can control it. He can control the sea. He can control the ocean. He can control the waves. But I can't, and you can't. No man can. You can't control God's, uh, you can't control God's power, and this world can't control God's power. And as we look out and we, we see some of the, uh, the great n- natural disasters, you look at, uh, at um, earthquakes and tsunamis and floods and, and uh, you know, global warming and, all, and global cooling, all these different things around us that we see uh, going on and, and volcanoes. And you know, Men can't control any of that. They like to think that they can control it, but they can't control any of that, and they're fools if they try. In Job 22 and verse 14, it says, He walketh in the circuit of heaven. Again, the idea of, just, just the, the idea of a, a powerful conqueror stepping on the, on the, on the, the neck of a, of a defeated king. And it's the idea he's over, he's defeated that king, he's in control of that king. In the same way God walks in the circuit of heaven, He is everywhere. He controls everything. His power is, is, is permeates everything in this universe. We can't escape Him. He's be, he is beyond us. He is above us. Psalm 104 and verse 3 we read, He walketh upon the wings of the wind. You know, He treadeth upon the sea. He walks in the circuit of the heaven. And He... And he treads upon the wings of the wind. Notice he doesn't say he runs or, or he flies. He walks. And that gives the idea of, of because his great power is in perfect control. You know, God is not, you know, his power is not frenzied. It's not, it's not ever reckless. It's always in control. It never, ever slips out of his control. He's always on top of things. Even though we look around and we say, man, things are, are chaotic. Things are falling apart. The, the world's, you know, just going in, in a whirlwind. What's going to happen? And we tend to fret. We worry and we rub our hands together and say, what's, what's tomorrow hold? I remind you, God is in total control. None of this has escaped him. None of this has slipped through his fingers. God is in control. You know, you look into the sky on a dark night and you see all the stars and, 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 and uh, what do you call it, the galaxies and things like that, and you wonder, where did it all come from? How did it all get there? Now realize that all of it came from nothing. It came from nothing because, you know, God had no material to work with. He created it all. He spoke it into existence out of nothing. You know, the great divine architect, he had no tools. He worked with his own power, and he spoke a word, and creation came into being. 
An old Christian said it rightly. He said, the world cannot make a fly, but God made this universe with one infallible word. The psalmist says, God has spoken once, twice have I heard this, that power belongeth unto God. Psalm 62 and verse 11. All he needed for creation was one word, and it all sprang into being. Hallelujah. What a God. Praise him. You can see his power in creation. Secondly, we see his power in preservation, his sustaining power. In Hebrews chapter 1, and verse 3, it teaches us that not only did God create this universe, but he upholds it by the very word of his power. You know, we can also look at that night sky and ask, you know, how does it all stay in place? How does it all work? How does everything stay balanced and not spinning out of control? You know, many a man and many a scientist has created something and it got out of control and they now cease to control it. You know, remember the virus? You know, the, the, the big pandemic that got out of control? You know, scientists today are tinkering around with all kinds of, of nonsense, viruses and cloning and DNA. Nothing can go wrong there, right? You know, <laughs> you know man has perfect control. No, no, it's, it's a recipe for disaster. But not our God. For what he wills, he has the power to, to do. And what he does, he has the power to sustain. He is almighty in his preserving power. Thirdly, he's also almighty in his restraining power. We look around the world today and we think to ourselves, things, could they possibly get any worse? You know, and there's a lot of negativity out there and there's a lot of gloom and doom and we don't know where the world's going and are we about to enter into, you know, the, the seven-year tribulation? Is the Lord ready to come back in any day? We don't, we don't know. We look around and we say, man, things are, they, they can't possibly get any worse. But imagine how much worse it will be or it would be if God's almighty sovereign hand was in curbing the sin and the wickedness that's in our world. The corruption that's growing is being held back by his restraining power. Without his restraining power, and iniquity and wickedness would flood this world. Sin would drown us and pull us in the cesspool of hell if it wasn't for God damming up the floodwaters of corruption. God does all this with his restraining power. The day is coming when the Bible says the restrainer will be taken out of the way. I believe that has us involved in that as well. Because through our influence, through we are called to be salt, we are called to be light, and through the power of the Holy Spirit within us, who is the restraining power, you know, we are to be the salt of the world, we are to be the light of the world. But sadly, I think, at least in the Western world, I, I believe that the, uh, the church has maybe lost some of its savor. You know, we've lost our savor. We've, we've hidden our, our, our light under a bushel. And we wonder why things are so wicked. We wonder why the world's getting worse and worse. Because we're quenching the restraining power of the Spirit of God in our lives and in our ministries. You know, but when the, when the restrainer is taken out of the uh, way, literally all hell will break loose on earth. You know, and we think it's bad now. Just can't imagine what it's going to be like when we're not here and when that restraint is taken out of the way. We can also see it, fourthly, in, in redemption. And this is the, the most powerful, in my mind, the most amazing power of God. The Bible says in Romans chapter 1, and verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for the pow it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. That's omnipotent power. The gospel is omnipotent power. The power that saved your soul is omnipotent power. What power could put away sins forever? By the blood of his cross. You know, only almighty power could redeem a lost sinner. You know, the work of redemption could only be accomplished with God's omnipotence. The world is in sin and utter darkness, and, uh, but his great, this great God has the power to redeem even those who are hopelessly lost. I can attest to that. There was a day when I was hopelessly lost. You know, 
And uh, I wasn't raised in a Christian home. I lived in the streets of Philadelphia. I was, a, I was a hoodlum. I was a drug addict. I had all kinds of issues. And the Lord, through the power of the gospel, transformed my life from the inside out. You know, he came to me in, in, the, you know, in just the unlikeliest person. Some little guy came along preaching the gospel. And you would think I would never listen. Nobody else listened to him, but I listened to him. And the Spirit of God spoke to my heart, and I got saved. Praise God for that. The almighty power of God. Now, what power could possibly, just think of that, the, the, the plan of redemption, what power could possibly unite two natures? The nature of God and the nature of man and fuse them into one person, our Lord Jesus Christ. In Luke chapter 1 and verse 35 uh, and 37, we read, The angel answered and said unto her, Mary... The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God, for with God nothing shall be impossible. Only almighty power could incarnate deity. And that's where you see it in the incarnation. You see it in the, also in the, the human life of the Lord Jesus Christ, the God-man. You know, it was the Lord in His humanity, in, in, his, in his, uh, his divine and human natures, uh, he, he spoke to the leper and said, If thou, if thou will, be thou clean, I will be thou clean. And immediately the leprosy was cleansed. He spoke to dead Lazarus and said, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came forth. In John 11, they're out on the boat, and the winds and the waves are tossing them to and fro, and the men are frantic, and they say, Care us not that we perish, Master. And he got up and he rebuked the sea, and he said, Peace, be still. And the response was, What manner of man is this that even the winds and sea obey him? That's the power of God demonstrated in the humanity and in the person of Jesus Christ. We see it. Also in, um, let's get back here where I was. We see it also in that this almighty God, you know, he rose from the grave unto new life. There's the power of God there. This almighty God, he sits in the majesty on high as a perfect God man next to his father in glory. This almighty God will come through the clouds one day and uh, descend from heaven, will take his own redeemed people to be with himself in glory. We see it in our conversion. There's greater power in the new birth than there is in your natural birth. There's greater power in, create, in recreation than in creation. You know, in creation, there was no one that opposed God. There was no sin in the world or anything like that. But in, in the conversion, there is, well, we have to deal with the devil. He's fighting against it. We have to deal with the world, which with all its influences, fight, influences fighting against it. And then, of course, we have to deal with my, my old, black, uh, depraved heart that opposes him. But Almighty God is able to overcome my heart by the power that raised his son from the dead and set him at the right hand of, his, uh, of the hand of God. That's the power that it takes to save me. Omnipotent power. If you're saved, it's going to take a greater power than that which made the... Uh, if you're not saved, I should say, it's, it's going to take a greater power than, than that which made the trees and the birds and the stars and the sun and, and everything else in order to save your soul. It's going to take omnipotent power. And God provides that power for the salvation of men. The wonder of it all is that power is right here, in your laps, in the Word of God, in the Gospel. It's available to you if you only take it. As I said, it, it, Paul said it's the, the, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. In 1 Corinthians 1.18, it says the preaching of the cross is the power of God. You know, and uh, someone said, God has salvation and damnation in his power. He has the key of justice in his hand to lock up whom he will. And he has the key of mercy in his hand to open heaven's gate to whom he pleases. The Bible says the Lord Jesus Christ is able to save to the uttermost because he has omnipotent power. Lastly, his power can be seen in judgment. 
For when God smites, no one can withhold. No one can resist. No one can withstand. Ezekiel 22 and verse 14 says, Can thine heart endure, or can thine hands be strong in the days that I shall deal with thee? I, the Lord, have spoken it, and I will do it. We can look at examples in Scripture. We can look at the flood. We can look at Sodom and Gomorrah. We can look at the Egyptians in the Red Sea. And just imagine that if God, after enduring with much long-suffering the vessels of wrath who have self-willed rebelled against Him, you know, if, and, and, uh, if, he should, if they should stand before Him in judgment, there's no one going to stop Him from judging them righteously and casting them into eternal damnation. You know, and uh, He has the power. You know, no one can stop him. No one can escape from his holy justice. Let's read Revelation 20. Now, what should we learn from this power of God? Well, the first thing that we learn is that we must be reconciled to him. This almighty God that created it all, this almighty God that, that, that created us, we are accountable to him. And if we're going to stand before this almighty God, we, we better be reconciled. We better be right with him. Because if we're not, then one day he will display his power in righteous judgment against those men and women who refuse to accept him and refuse to surrender to him. We have his word on that. Hebrews 10.31 says that it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. The power to make us tremble. It makes the devils tremble. You know, and, uh, and if you're a lost sinner, the thought of facing Almighty God ought to make you quake with fear. Realize I'm going to stand before God, and I'm not right. What a, what a, uh, what a uh, just a, a trepidous place to be. The Lord Jesus says, Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. Whether you tremble or not now, you will tremble if you stand before him uh, in judgment. Jeremiah says, who knows the power of his wrath? Nahum says, his fury is poured out like fire and rocks are thrown down by him. In Psalm 2, the psalmist implores, kiss the son lest he be angry with thee. We need to be right with God. Now is the time, the Bible says, for reconciliation. Men need to turn from their sin now and be reconciled to God. Because if you, if you don't, after we pass from this world, it's too late. The great judgment from the omnipotent God will fall on your head if, you don't, if you're not reconciled to him today. Would you not rather have God for you than against you? It's crazy, insane to to think you're going to be able to spit in the face of God and shake your fist in God and say, I will not submit a God who can snuff us out in a second. Some people have the idea that God is, is love, and, and He is. There's no doubt about that. And, but they say, since God is love and He cares for this world, and He cares for His creation, then they can live in their sin, and God is compelled to somehow lovingly protect them. That's nonsense. That's not in the Bible. It sounds good. It's good preaching. It makes for popular preaching. I'm sure a lot of people like to hear that. But it's nonsense. It's not biblical. God is angry, the Bible says, with a wicked sinner every day. The power of God is against the wicked. And unless you have the, the blood of Jesus Christ to, uh, to cover your sins, the almighty God's wrath is looming over you. And when it comes down to it, it's, when it's over, there's no escape. And that's what you need to learn from the power of God. You must be reconciled to Him. Now, some people say, might say, well, that, that's, that's uh, very negative preaching. You know, that, that's uh, fear-mongering. You know, the Bible does say that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. You know, and uh, I'm not making this up. This isn't something where I'm just coming off the top of my head and trying to, to scare people into heaven. No, the Bible warns us. If I were to warn someone not to play in traffic because it's dangerous and they get hit by a car, well, you know, it's, would warning them be cruel? Would warning them be fear-mongering? Or would it be, 
would it be just caring for people and not wanting them to get hurt? We have a responsibility, brethren, to warn people. You know, it's not enough to say, oh, just come to Jesus and everything will be fine. We need to tell them why they need to come to Jesus. Because if they don't, they're going to stand before Him and face His wrath. Omnipotent God and no man escapes. The second thing that we, des- uh, that we learn here uh, of the power of God is that He deserves our worship. When we come here today, He deserves our praise. He deserves our thoughts being directed to His greatness and His glory. And He deserves to be exalted and lifted up in our midst. God is not just some kind of impersonal influence. He's not some good force out there. He's a person. A person whom we can approach. We can approach Him as our Father, as our Savior, as our Lord. He is the great I Am. Yet you and I in Christ can speak to Him in the most intimate human language that exists. We can call Him Father. Call Him Papa. You know, the Bible calls it Abba. You know, Abba, Father. We, he, he is our God. The omnipotent, immensely powerful being who brought it all into being. He's our Father. Does that not just amaze you? That, you know, to think where I came from, what I was, coming from darkness on the light, and, and not only that, it would have been great just to get saved, but then to find out that not only am, am I saved, but now I am a child of God. God made me His own. A.W. Tozer said, A worshiping man finds this knowledge of God's power, a source of wonderful strength for his inner life. His faith rises to take a great leap forward into fellowship with God, who can do whatever He wills to do, for whom nothing is too hard or difficult because He possesses power absolute. Man, to know that our God is an almighty God, to know that our God is so powerful, that's a joy. Because there's so much impacted into that 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 helps us to realize that my salvation is secure. No man can pluck me out of God's hand. No man can can stop what God has caused in my life. God will finish it. Even though I, I admit, I look at my life and I say, you know, I'm so far from perfect. I've been saved. Almost 50, no, oh, it's been 50 years. It's been 50 years. It'll be 50 years this, uh, uh, this fall uh, that I've been saved. 50 years, I thought I'd be a lot further ahead than I am, you know. <laughs> you know, a lot of stumbles along the way, and I'm so far from perfect, you know. And, and yet, it, it's easy to say, you know what, I, I just, things didn't work out as, you know, great as I thought. That, I'm, I'm not the, the wonderful th- saint that I thought I was going to be. Then I'm reminded that it's not all about me. It's all about Him and what He's doing in my life. You know, and it may seem like it's taken a long time, but eventually God will get me where I need to be. I will be like Jesus. You will be like Jesus if you're born again today. You know, and um, we are going to be reigning with Him. We're going to be uh, uh, married to Him, if you will. You know, and when this God is revealed to you, you ought to feel like, like all the other prophets in Scripture that face God, they, what did they do? They fell on their faces before Him. How can we not just fall before Him and say, Lord, You are worthy. And we are so unworthy. And we, are, uh, we, we just give You all the praise and the glory. You ought to fall at His feet and worship Him. Like Isaiah, who fell on His feet and says, Woe am I, for I am a man of unclean lips. Or Peter, you know, and when he says, Lord, depart from me, for I am a sinful man. Or, or Paul, when he fell on his face, Ezekiel, Daniel, and throughout Scripture, you know, and they fell on their faces before God because He is worthy. Thirdly, another thing we learn is He should be trusted. Because He is all-powerful, there's no reason we can't trust Him. There's no reason you can't trust Him with your Christian life. There's no reason you can't trust Him with your needs. You can lay your life at His feet and say, Father, help me. Father, protect me. Father, provide for me. And there's nothing can stop Him from what He needs to do in your life. It may not always be what we want, but we know that our Father will always be there for us, and we can trust Him. There's absolutely no problem that He cannot help you with. 
Wherever you are today, whatever, whatever you're dealing with, whatever uh, tragedies you might be, be grappling with, whatever shortcomings, whatever pain, whatever suffering that you're dealing with, understand that God is there to help you. And nothing is too great for your God. This Almighty One does everything without effort. He never gets tired. He never needs to be replenished. He never needs to take a break. He never looks outside of Himself for help. This is the one that you need to trust. Pastor Simpson had broken health and was deeply discouraged and disillusioned and despondent. He was ready to just quit the ministry. But one day he heard a, an old spiritual, old Negro, Negro spiritual that, that went like this. He said, nothing is too hard for Jesus. No man can work like him. You know, and those words like an arrow pierced into the pastor's heart. And he found that he had to leave all his concerns. And he went to a place of quiet to spend time with God. And after a few days, in the presence of God, he rose, completely cured of his physical ailment. He went forth in the fullness of joy to, to found what had become a great missionary organization, the Christian Missionary Alliance. And for 35 years after that encounter with God, he labored for Christ tirelessly. And you say, well, what happened to him? What, what, what changed in his life? What happened to him was his faith in God focused on the limitless power of God. He got a hold of the power of God, and he connected with it, and he got the, he, he got the grip with it, and, and, and he plugged into that great omnipotent power of God, and it made a difference in his life and his ministry. Brethren, do you believe that there's no power too hard for him to answer? There's no, excuse me, no prayer too hard for him to answer. Do you believe that there's no problem too difficult for him to solve? Do you believe that there's no need too great for him to meet? No passion too strong for him to subdue? No temptation too great for him to deliver us from? The psalmist says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Now, His great power can be the strength of your life and my life. Of whom shall we be afraid? God is my power, and His power is, is, un, is limitless. Paul says His power is eternal in Romans 1, verse 20. You know what that means? That means that I don't have to worry about tomorrow. I don't have to worry about tomorrow because you know, His power will be as great tomorrow as it is today as it was yesterday. There's no need to worry about tomorrow because God is there and He's in control. This power is a source of encouragement to our hearts. It ought to give us the joy of the Lord to know that, that our God is so powerful. Jeremiah saw it as such and said, Ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. Do you believe that? When he says that he is able to save to the uttermost, that he's able to secure the, uh, succor them that are tempted, that he's able to keep you from falling, that he's able to build you up, that he's able to establish you, and when we reach that last great enemy of death, he's able to change our vile bodies that it might be fashioned like unto his own glorious body. He's able. He's able. I'm not able. You're not able. We can go so far and invariably we're going to fall flat on our faces. We're going to fail. We, we can't do what God is doing in our lives. We can't complete it in our own power. I am weak. I am sinful. I get tempted. I get discouraged. I get brokenhearted. Praise God. He is able. Even though I fall short, He's always there to grab me by the scruff of the collar and pick me up again. He'll never fail you. He'll never forsake you. But His irresistible, inexhaustible, eternal power is there for your taking. As we close, one saint was dying, and a friend asked him, what if after you trusted God for so many years that he would not be able to save you? And that old dying saint said, well, he would lose much more than I would, 
I would only lose my miserable soul. But he would lose his great name. His great name, one of his great names is El Shaddai, the all-powerful. God is almighty, and he is your God. Hallelujah. Praise God. He is your God. Let's pray. Our Father, we, we do thank you. We come to you today just to exalt your name, to praise you, to lift you up, and Lord, just to bow before you in all of your greatness. Lord, as we consider your power, Lord, we, we only get glimpses of it, but even these glimpses are so amazing. And Father, we just thank you for the power that provides salvation to our needy souls, the power that you provide to, to help us in our time of need. I pray, Lord, that whatever need might be here today, if there's someone here that doesn't know you as personal Savior, I pray that you speak to them and show them the saving power that's available to them. Lord, whatever the need might be, I pray, Father, that you would, you would meet with hearts today and that you would uh, help them, Lord, to grab hold of this fantastic truth of your power. Bless this day. Be with us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.